This Week in Microbiology is brought to you by the American Society for Microbiology at microbeworld.org slash twim. This Week in Microbiology, episode number 29, recorded on March 16th, 2012. Hi, everybody. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you're listening to TWIM, the podcast that explores unseen life on Earth. Joining me today from San Diego State University, Stan Malloy. How are you doing there, Stan? Hi, Vincent. It's good to talk to you. It's been a few months, hasn't it? It has, absolutely. Time flies when you're having fun. <laughs> Everything okay with you? Working hard? Working very hard. Things are good. <laughs> Very good. I bet you have great weather out there right now. Actually, no, it's cloudy. It might rain. We need a little bit of rain out here right really? now. So and It's been raining here all day. But you know, it is um, unseasonably warm here in the Northeast. It's been in the 60s. The crocuses are blooming. Early summer, or early spring, nice. I should say. It's kind of nice. Nice. Very nice. Well, today, Alio and Michael are AWOL, so it's just you and me. Can we handle this? I'll bet we can do it. I bet. We have two great papers today. First one I came across a couple of weeks ago, and I said, I have to do this on TWIM. It has to do with a virus, but it is a virus that infects bacteria. And so I think it's perfect for uh, for TWIM. And this is a cell paper that came out in February of this year. It's called Phage Pierces the Host Cell Membrane with the Iron-Loaded Spike. Now, that title alone was pretty intriguing to me. And when I, when I looked at it, I said, we have to do this. This is from uh, Peter Lyman's lab. And the authors are Browning, Schneider, Bowman, Schwarzer, and Lehman. And this has to do with uh, the phages that, uh, bacteriophages, of course, are viruses that infect bacteria, and, and particularly the, the tailed phages, where they have this very unusual injection uh, mechanism for putting their genome into the host cell. Of course, that's what a virus has to do. It has to get its genome into a host cell because otherwise it, it can't replicate it. And the tailed phages, which are, well, I guess the most famous one would be phage T4, which maybe everyone knows about. They keep their DNA in, a, in an icosahedral head that's attached to a long tube. And then at the end of the tube, there's a base plate. And around the tube is a called a contractile sheath. And these phages attach to the host cell via the, the base plate. And then the sheath contracts and it drives the tube uh, into the membrane of the bacterium. It pokes a hole in and then the DNA goes through the tube into the host cell. So, so Vincent, before you go on, yeah. if I could say, so first of all, I think I, when I was a graduate student taking my qualifying exams, I was asked, how do viruses get inside of cells. Mm -hmm. right? And you know, it was a big perplexing problem at the time. And no one would ask about phage because they thought we fully understood <laughs> how phage get their DNA into cells because of this model that you just described for phage T4. Yeah, which has been around for a while, right? It's been around for a while. And in fact, it's probably way, way oversimplified. Mm -hmm. So um, it's, it's not a simple hyperdermic syringe that's injecting the DNA. And so the mechanisms are are so different and unique, and that's why a paper like this one today is really important for our understanding, is because ultimately these papers may lead to a new model that's distinct from that hypodermic syringe model. Now, this these phages have slowly been uh, been studied by structural biologists over the years, and the way they do it is they take each component and they they solve the structure of the head, then the, the sheath, the base plate. So for T4, we have a lot of structural information about this. But the part that actually sticks into the membrane, the spike or the central spike in the base plate, we don't have the structure of that. And that's what this paper addresses, that, that little spike at the end of the tube, which is presumably what goes through the membrane. So they call it a cell puncturing device. Um, and this, interestingly, has some analogies with type 6 secretion systems, which you probably are very familiar with, uh, Stan. These are yes. 
these are structures and bacteria that are used to inject things into host cells, right? Right. Absolutely. So apparently they have some structural analogy with these with these spike proteins, and as you'll see uh, later on, they have they have quite a bit of analogy. Which isn't too surprising. Once nature invents a really good idea, yeah. it makes sense you'd reuse it. Of course. Use it over, steal it. Right. Use it over and over again, right? Right. So in this paper, they decided to look at this spike protein. And what they did was to look at uh, two different phages, not T4, which they say are structurally more simple and which might be more amenable to uh, to studying. And those two phages are P2, which is a phage of E. coli, right, Stanley? Yes. It's a tailed phage, of course. And phe 92 And I'd not heard of phe 92 but I understand it's a cholera phage. Is that correct? That's correct. And this is, must be another model phage that, that people work with, right? It's not used that commonly, but of course, people care about phage that infect cholera because it may lead to some treatment for cholera, ultimately. Mm-hmm. So they uh, are studying these two phages, and one of the things they start with is the, the knowledge that the spike proteins on both of these phages have a, a specific domain, which is called an N-terminal oligonucleotide oligosaccharide binding domain, which they call a an OB fold or a knob domain. All right, and they they look for this signature in in the proteins of these phages, and that's how they decide which one to crystallize because uh, these phages are made up of many different structural proteins, and they have to pick one to, to produce and purify and, and uh, crystallize. So they did that for both of these phages. They identified the protein that would most likely have this uh, OB fold, and they're two different proteins. They have different names in either, in either bacteriophage. And then what follows in this paper is, is very typical for crystallography, a lot of failure. <laughs> <laughs> they express these proteins. They even get crystals, and they don't give them the data that they need. And they try this over and over. They make various changes, in the, and they, they don't get – they get beautiful crystals in some cases, but they don't give them enough resolution, or if they do give resolution, they don't get the structure. And it's, it's, uh, it's all documented here, and this took a lot of – people, I'm sure, a lot of time to do this. Finally, they make a deletion uh, of a particular, one of the proteins that gives great crystals that, that resolve and give them the structure that they need. So there's a lot of sweat here uh, involved. The structure is just beautiful. So we have two different proteins, one from each of the phages, and it looks just like a spike. Um, it, it In both cases, it's made up of a very interesting series of um, beta strands that get shorter and shorter as you go from the widest part of the spike to the narrowest part of the spike. And if you, we're going to post a, a link to these images for you to see. They're just beautiful, and, and they get it gets narrower and narrower until they reach the very tip. Uh, and then at the very tip, there are three beta hairpins which they say, this is very poetic, which come together like petals in a flower bud. <laughs> and they make the very spike. And you can see that this is quite sharp. In fact, one is sharper than the other, but they're, they're both quite sharp. And that would presumably be the part that sticks into uh, the cell membrane. Uh, and then at the top, there are also some beta structures which make the wider part, which presumably would be interacting uh, with the tube. So this looks very much like a spike. One thing I found very interesting is that um, so these are trimers uh, of three individual proteins, okay? Um, and for one of the spikes, the, the beta strands are intertwined among two subunits. So you have a couple of strands from one subunit, then a couple of strands from another, and then another. It's very interesting. The other one is not like that. Uh, the phe 92 one is not, but the one from P2 alternates. I found that very interesting. So, it's like it's a, a really tight, structurally sound spike. Yeah. Right? Which I guess it would have to be because it's going to stick into the membrane, right? So it's really nice, and it looks, and they say, in fact, that it looks like this is actually what goes into the bacterium. There was some idea that maybe there were conformational changes that occur on, on either phage binding or contraction of the sheath, but it looks like this thing goes into the bacterium uh, intact, just like this. Um, inside of this um, 
structure. Yeah, if you if you look um, down at the very the tip, these these beta um, hairpins, there are a couple of interesting molecules. And one is there is a, mo- a single molecule of iron bound in there. There are actually four uh, histidine residues uh, that are coming together and coordinating uh, the binding of the iron. And then that's in fact where the title of the paper comes from. Uh, they say it's a spike bound by. Um, containing a molecule of iron. So that's very pretty. I, I think this picture of the four histidines uh, is really interesting. They think the iron has a structural role, maintaining the integrity of this spike uh, protein. They say it probably uh, helps fold uh, the, the trimer, keep the three uh, chains together, and it probably gives it stability once it, it's folded so that obviously this thing has to sh- insert into the membrane and Maybe the iron gives it some stability. But that's something you could test by mutagenesis, of course. You could try changing uh, the histidines and, and seeing what happens if you don't have iron in there. Yeah, I think that would be a really important experiment to do. Of course, you wouldn't have done that without the structural information, right? You wouldn't right. know that there's an iron in there or in this place or that it might have some importance. So that's very interesting. Uh, there are also some uh, some calcium ions in here as well. Um which they think uh, is probably important for for absorption of the phage uh, to the uh, to the host cell surface as well. So it's a very nice snapshot of um, of what's going on here structurally. Now, at the same time, they also did a structure of the base plate by a lower resolution uh, technique, cryoelectron microscopy, and that's shown here in Figure Six. And the reason they do this is they want to see how this spike now fits into the overall structure. So what you can do if you do a cryo uh, EM structure, in the structure they solve, you can see in the middle of the base plate, uh, there's a spike coming out. So they take their their, uh, structure, which they've solved for the spike by X-ray crystallography, and they fit it into the cryo EM structure. You can see it fits very nicely. Mm -hmm. So this gorgeous trimeric spike, which tapers down to a very sharp point, fits right into... Uh, the middle of this base plate. And so that is probably how this uh, works when the base plate is sitting on the host cell surface. Uh, the contraction of the tail of the sheath occurs to drive this spike uh, into the membrane. The spike goes through the membrane and it, it pokes a hole uh, in the membrane. And they, they speculate a bit. They say the tip is very sharp and it's very stable because we have these three subunits with the iron in it, so it probably is, is structurally strong and can stand this this forcing, if you will, uh, into the bacterial membrane. And then then they say that the um, the spike is probably a plug uh, on the tube, and and this spike probably falls off to allow the DNA to come out. So the spike is driven into the cell, it makes a hole, and then it falls off, uh, and then the DNA comes out. And some evidence for that is that um, the spike will actually dissociate uh, from the tube at low pH, which they say occurs in the periplasm of the bacterium. Is that is that right, Stanley? Absolutely, that's right. Because of the flux of ions across the membrane and yeah. the redox potential in the periplasmic space being different, yes. So the, I should point out that this figure six, it is just beautiful. It is yeah. a work of art, it's <laughs> don't lovely. you think? Yeah, it's great. It, it it has the a picture of the phage themselves and right. then the modeling of these structures. I guess I'm not so sure that the the lower pH in the periplasm is is very solid evidence mm. that the spike falls off. But I think what it does is give you a testable model. Sure. I guess you could also say that um, the, maybe the DNA pushes it off. Um, pushes that maybe there's enough force because you know the DNA is packed into the head at very high pressure right right it could be that that's enough to push the tip off um, I don't know absolutely it's a very interesting idea though so that's what that's the overall model and the structure now they have this um, OB fold and they know the structure of it and, and of course the protein sequence and they use that to search uh, all the known proteins and they, they come up with quite a few uh, other proteins which they call putative spike proteins from uh, other phages as well. And so now 
and people can go and look at these if, if they happen to be one that they're working on and see if, in fact, that constitutes the spike proteins of those as well. Now, the same, uh, the same kind of domain um, is also present on the type 6 uh, secretion systems, as we said earlier, uh, this uh, OB binding domain. And so presumably, as, as we said earlier, this is a mechanism that's been conserved, maybe evolved a long time ago. Uh, those, those type 6, um, Stanley, do they involve contractile mechanisms or just membrane puncturing? Oh, uh, membrane puncturing, primarily. And how, uh, how are they regulated? They're regulated differently based on different organisms, but very often it's it, it contact with the cell that you want to export into that uh, turns these systems on. I, I think the analogy is really interesting. And in fact, maybe it, the type 6 system, maybe that gives you some insight into how these work. Mm -hmm. I mean, the fact that they don't have that same high-pressure DNA forced inside of a phage head, yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe that suggests that's not the mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know something, Vincent, while you were talking, I was wondering this, and, and I don't recall the answer, although I'm sure you know it. How long is this spike relative to the width of the membrane? Hmm. You, you remember that? If it pierces the membrane, it must be... It has to be longer than Longer. That, yeah. <laughs> they say it's 10 angstroms in diameter. Uh -huh. And it's several oh, okay. t it's several times longer than um, it is it is wide. So it would be I would say it's forty or fifty angstroms long. Right. And how how thick is a membrane? Let's let's oh. look that up. Uh, how, well, it's not just a bilayer, right? No, but a bilayer is a pretty good approximation for the outer membrane in this case. It's 40, not too far off. Forty five uh, angstroms. Right. So this is probably. Uh, 50 angstroms long, just enough to, to span it, right? Yeah. Right, absolutely. Interesting. It would be interesting to have some pictures of um, the actual puncturing in process. I don't know if anyone has ever done that, to try and freeze it at some state where you could photograph that, right? I, I think if you could catch those real-time actions at this level of molecular detail, that would be it would really give us a lot of insight into biology. So you said that the injection idea is not correct. So this idea well, that the, 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 the sheath does contract, though, and forces the, the point into right. the cell, right? So, so the basic idea of the contraction was once we saw these beautiful electron micrographs of T4, it just looked like a hypodermic syringe. Right. And so people said, well, this is the way that all of these phage will work. And some phage, so I've worked on a phage called P22 that infects salmonella, and it's got this little puny tail, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. And so the best it could do is cross the outer membrane, and salmonella has both an outer membrane and an inner membrane. And so uh, many years ago, Mimi Suskin showed that, in fact, it injects its DNA into the periplasm, mm -hmm. and then that DNA has to get across the cytoplasmic membrane. So, so it's not a hypodermic that goes all the way. It delivers it to the first place, and then there are phage-specific proteins that actually act as a transporter across the cytoplasmic huh. membrane. I see. So, so the, it's 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 a little more complicated and cool. So the DNA is associated with phage proteins in P twenty two. Yeah, it, that's very common in in different phage, that there will be some proteins associated with the DNA. I think it's pretty common in most viruses, isn't it? Uh, depending on the virus, um, the DNA viruses do, some of the smaller RNA viruses, many of the positive strand RNA viruses do not uh -huh. have, have proteins associated with them because the RNA gets in the cell and then just is translated right. immediately. I'm looking at some pictures of P22 Many structures, and you're right. It's just the base plate, almost attached directly to the icosahedral head. <laughs> right, <laughs> but it does have a spike. It has a central spike, uh -huh. uh, which which pokes the hole in, right? Yes, it does. And you can show the DNA gets ejected. We say ejected instead of injected. It gets mm -hmm. dumped into the periplasm. It's interesting. And then there's these phage proteins that actually form a pore across the cytoplasmic membrane, and they require the cell's energy to bring the DNA into the cell. Yeah, yeah. Oh. There's so many structures of these sheaths and plates. It's amazing. 
I guess it's really something structural biologists are very interested in. I, I think this was one of the places where you could get large amounts of some yeah. macro structure that were pretty pure. And so it became one of yeah. the favorite toys of structural biologists early on. Right. So We tend to like to make generalities once we find a T4 injection. We make, okay, they're all like this, but... And if, as you study, you learn new things and you realize everything is different. There are lots of subtleties. So I love this paper. I think it's gorgeous and um, it just provokes a lot of thought and the structure is just beautiful. So do have a look at it, everyone. Uh, unfortunately, it is in cell, which uh, means it's behind a prey wall, so it might be hard for all of you. It's in structure, which is a cell journal. But... Um, Hopefully you can get an idea. If you can't access it, you can get an idea of how, how beautiful it is from, from us talking about it. It, it, it. One more thing I'd sure. like to mention about this, Vincent. You know, uh, oftentimes we think you can have real DNA databases and you can search and find anything you want in those databases. But when you look at the DNA of all of the phages that have been sequenced, and there's so many of them, they have a very high proportion of genes of unknown function. Right, right. Roughly on the order of 70%, so mm -hmm. a tremendous amount. And this is a really nice example of once you've crystallized something, you know what to look for, and you can now go back to those DNA sequences and find really important hits that you would have missed before you had the sure. structure. Yep. So... Yeah, now we know what to look for, and uh, and we can study that. Do you know if the uh, if any of the type six structures have been solved? I don't know, but that doesn't mean it's not happened. I yeah, just don't yeah, know. I don't know, and it would be interesting to know how right. similar or dissimilar it is to this. Right. Okay, um, our second paper I I looked I picked because um, not too long ago on TWIM. We did another paper from this group on the MAS EF uh, toxin antitoxin system. So, this is a, an extension of that, which I thought might be interesting. Are you familiar with this, uh, this suicide system, as it's called, Stanley? Yeah, this is really an interesting system. So, the paper is called Two Programmed Cell Death Systems in E. coli, an apoptotic like death is inhibited by the MAS EF mediated death pathway. And the senior author on this paper uh, is H Hannah Engelberg Kolka. And this is Elio Schechter's cousin. Uh, that's so. right. That's right. It's, he mentioned this last time. <laughs> you know, before that show, he said, Is it okay if I mention that it's my cousin? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, and so, and the two other authors on the paper are Aaron Tall and Sharon. And, and I actually know Hannah quite well and have known her for a long time. And she's been interested in this pathway for quite a while. Here's the basic deal. So in case people don't remember when the MAS EF pathway was talked about last time, this is a two-protein system. These are, are called addiction modules. And so there's a toxin and an antitoxin. And they're they're made at the same time, but... The toxin is very stable protein, and the antitoxin is unstable. So what that means is if you quit synthesizing them, the toxin will stay around and kill the cell because the antitoxin's gone. But if they're continually being made, then the antitoxin inactivates the toxin and everybody's happy. Okay? So we call these addiction system because you're addicted to the antitoxin. Mm. These systems play many, many roles in biology of, of bacteria. Well, one of the things that they do is they're really important for plasmids to keep plasmids from um, segregating or from being lost from a cell. Mm -hmm. The plasmid will have one of these systems. If you lose the plasmid, that cell dies. And so the plasmid ensures its presence in the population of bacteria. Is this present in many different species of bacteria? Many different species, and there are lots and lots of different types of toxin antitoxin systems. And in your favorite uh, salmonella, it's also present? Absolutely. Mm -hmm. For many of these kinds of things, salmonella and E. coli are very, very similar. Mm -hmm. And that's true of the MAS EF system, too. 
So, so MOS EF is, is a special one. So it's on the chromosome of the bacterium. And Hannah and her group have been studying for quite a while to try to understand what this MOS EF does. And in this paper, they're trying to make the argument that what this system does is inhibit a pathway like the program cell death pathway in eukaryotic cells. Okay. So program cell death and apoptosis, this is a system where some cells altruistically commit suicide for the good of the whole. Right? Is, it, is that fair, Vincent? <laughs> it's very fair. It's very puzzling, too. <laughs> So, it, you know, a wonderful example of this is during embryogenesis, when you're trying to develop a whole organism from these small collection of cells, some cells need to grow, other cells need to die to allow the structures to be built. And so it's it's all set up in a programmed way so that the choreography works and you end up with an organism at the end. There are also cases where you have a stress and it doesn't it doesn't pay to continue most of the population so you kill most of it off and in a minimum survive right right it's interesting at the their last sentence is how to maintain an altruistic trait a problem that remains a curious and unresolved biological puzzle many people wonder how what is the selection for altruism right people have been arguing about that <laughs> since the dawn of genetics i think <laughs> So the, the basic idea here is that this MOS-F is the toxin and MOS-E is the antitoxin, right? Yeah. And the idea here is that under stressful conditions, in this case DNA damage, you produce these particular proteins, right? And when you don't have enough of the antitoxin, the toxin does a really weird thing. It cuts RNA, and it, it just cuts off the start codon. Mm -hmm. So you need the start codon to be able to translate that RNA. So it cuts off the start codon. So now you have all this RNA that you can't translate. So that will completely change gene expression once you turn on this guy. And the second thing it does is it modifies one of the proteins in one of the um, RNAs within the ribosome that recognizes mRNAs and facilitates translation. So this system is really just screwing up translation royal. You get actually a re a translation of a subpopulation of, of mRNAs that don't need Shine Delgarno, right? Because you've taken right. it off the ribosome. So of all of the many, many proteins that can be made in a cell, now you're this DNA damage turns on this system and it forces you to only make a subset of the proteins in the cell. Right. right? And the, the argument is that what's going to happen here is now a large proportion of the cells in the population will die and they will sacrifice their lives for the good of those few survivors provide nutrients for the survivors, they may provide growth factors or other things. And so this is why they describe this as being an altruistic system. They say about 10% of the population typically survives. The number, it's about, on the average, about 10%, but in fact, varies, it varies yeah. somewhat with different conditions. Yeah. So in this paper, the, the big question that they're asking, they're saying, well, look, this, this has some similarities to the program cell death. And so the some of the key features of program cell death, is it involved in that as well, right? And when in higher or eukaryotic organisms... You, st when, you stopped saying higher. <laughs> yeah, I caught myself. <laughs> um, in, in eukaryotic organisms, when they undergo apoptosis, they do a few things. And one of the, one of the first things they do is they have... Uh, membrane depolarization, right? That is, they, they, they change the charge across the cell membrane. So the first thing that these people do is they say, well, does MOSEF mediated cell death, does it influence membrane depolarization? So, so the way you, you test this is, is pretty cool. There are 
certain compounds that um, have fluorescence. And if the membranes are polarized, they will accumulate inside of a cell. And if they're depolarized, then they don't. So you can, you can determine whether the membrane's polarized or depolarized by the accumulation of these compounds inside the cell. Right? So you can take a whole bunch of these cells, you run them through a, a flow cytometer, and what that does is it, it measures the proportion of these cells that are fluorescent versus the ones that aren't fluorescent. And what they found was when they cause DNA damage, they use two different agents to do that, but when they stimulate DNA damage, that in cells that were mutant for MOSEF, that lacked MOSEF, then membrane depolarization occurred. Right. So what that what that means is that MOSEF is inhibiting the membrane depolarization. So MOSEF is preventing something that looks like this apoptotic pathway. And this kind of experiment requires lots of controls. And so in the process of doing this, they test a whole slew of other conditions. But the, the real take-home point is that that MOSEF seems to inhibit the membrane depolarization. Now, there's one other thing that is a big hallmark of apoptosis that's probably the most common feature of apoptosis, and that is that when cells start to undergo this program cell death, their DNA gets fragmented. So instead of being large, contiguous chromosomes, it's broken up into little pieces. Right. And and so when when you break a big long string into a whole bunch of small parts, you have a lot more ends. Right. And so because of that, people developed an assay for this DNA fragmentation, and it's called the tunnel assay. And that actually means something. So it stands for terminal dinucleotidal transferase UTP NIC end labeling. <laughs> <laughs> I like tunnel. <laughs> oh, tunnel, right? But, but the, the idea is, is actually a, a pretty simple and pretty cool idea. There is an enzyme that will add, a uracil from UTP will add that to the end of a DNA molecule, right? And so if there's a lot of ends, it will add lots of these uracil residues to those ends. And if the uracil residue has a fluorescent group on it, then if there's lots of ends, you get lots of fluorescence. And if there's very few ends, you get very little fluorescence. Right? So I really like nice, simple, clever assays. And I think this is a great example of that. So, so the idea is they say, well, if this system, the MOSEF system, actually prevents apoptosis, how, does it affect self DNA fragmentation? And so they add the agents that damage DNA, and they ask, does fragmentation occur? And they test all of these different conditions, and the only time they see substantial fragmentation is when they have a mutant that disrupts MOSEF. Now, I'm going to go through this backwards again, because when, you, when the, you see the effect in the mutant, what that means is the mutant is inhibiting that effect, right? It's kind of backwards thinking. But so this is, it's very similar to the result they got with the other major treatment, which was the membrane polarization. So basically, these results look like MOSEF is inhibiting this apoptosis-like cell death pathway. They call it ALD, A-L-D. And it's called like apoptosis-like because it has these two cardinal features of Apoptosis, the membrane permeabilization and the, and the DNA dam fragmentation, right? Right. Yeah. So the, then the, the, the other question that they ask is that d DNA damage has been studied for a long, long time in bacteria and, and in eukaryotic cells because if you understand DNA damage, you could potentially treat a lot of diseases. And it also gives us basic insights into you know, how DNA uh, is made and repaired. And so we know from many, many, many years of studies that there is a protein called RecA that's involved in recombination and repair of DNA, and that 
when you damage DNA, Rec A is involved in a process uh, that can turn on a whole bunch of different genes in the cell. Okay? It's a pathway called it an SOS pathway because when you turn on this pathway, it means you are in deep doo doo, and so <laughs> you know. It, but it's it's an, an SOS signal. If you don't do something, you're going to die. That's that's really what it means when when this pathway is turned on, and so they they did these same. Uh, studies uh, with MOZIF and looked at membrane depolarization, and they found that um, in the Rec A mutant, it, they no longer get depolarization, hmm. even without MOZIF, right? Without MOZIF, so it's it told them well, Rec A is probably upstream, and Rec A is involved in. The initial stages that turns on this pathway that allows MOZIF to go do its business. And th they did a really important thing. Whenever you make a mutant and you come to a big conclusion like that, you have to do complementation analysis. So they brought into these cells a plasmid that can make Rec A. Mm -hmm. And when they have that plasmid, it totally reverses the, the property that they saw. Okay, So Re Rec A really plays a key role here. And it says the conclusion is that activation of this apoptotic-like E. coli death pathway is under the control of the SOS DNA damage response. Okay. So basically, um, in a nutshell, that's really the key and important findings of this paper. Pretty cool things because it suggests that uh, one of these pathways that we really thought was was just restricted to eukaryotic cells, there's something very, very similar to it that's happening in bacteria. And so it, it's kind of what we call the unity of biochemistry. Hmm. Things don't have to be exactly the same, but once you've developed these general principles, you seem to find them reused hmm. throughout biology. It's like what we said last time. We used to think bacteria were bags of enzymes. Now we know they have cytoskeletons just like eukaryotic cells. Right. <laughs> All the things that I learned in graduate schools as being difference between eukaryotes and, and bacteria, in fact, many of them have fallen by the wayside. Makes sense. I mean, they're ancestral, right? So one evolved from the other. Makes perfect sense. That they have yeah, a lot absolutely. of similarities. One one thing that's very uh, interesting here: this Mas EF pathway requires a peptide to be active, right? Yes. Um, a pentapeptide in a very specific one, and they show here in this paper that in fact you need this peptide around in order for to have this inhibition of the alternative uh, death pathway. So that makes sense because you know you need the peptide to activate the the Mas EF. Um, Toxin antitoxin pathway, but what? What? Um, this is a little diversion, but what makes this peptide? Do you know? And um, is it produced by cells them, by the same bacteria that have the MOZIF in them? I don't think that they've nailed this down totally. I see. But the preliminary results suggest that this peptide is produced by those cells, and it's actually uh, produced by some proteolytic fragments of other proteins that are present in those cells. I see. So it's one of the I very see. early responses to damage. Okay. Right? So the idea is when you have a whole population of cells, millions of cells, and they undergo this DNA damage, then you'll release a lot of this peptide into the medium, mm -hmm. and it acts as a quorum sensing. So if there's not enough of that peptide around... No, no use being altruistic if there's no one else around that you're dying for, right? So if there's a lot of cells around, there will be enough of this peptide to stimulate the process. Okay. But at low concentrations of bacteria, then the, you see. just don't have enough yeah. peptide. And at low concentration, you're not worried about stresses on the population. So, right. And this this peptide binds um, MOZF and releases the 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 repressor so that then the, the, the ribonuclease could go on and chew up all the, the mRNAs, as we said earlier. Yes. I see. Right. Okay. That would make sense that, it would, that the peptide would be required to have this other death pathway activated then, right? Yes, absolutely. So it's a it's pretty clever system that is dependent upon this quorum sensing. So the peptide's a quorum sensing type of peptide. 
and a, a couple of really major important cell death pathways. And, and then the conclusion of all this, you say, okay, why does it matter? Mm -hmm. So you go now from data to just so stories, <laughs> right? <laughs> so, so the idea of this being altruism is one way that you can explain the data so that it makes sense. But proving altruism is really a very, very difficult thing to do, right? But so the idea is that since you know, one to 10% of the cells survive and all the rest of the guys die, they're saying, well, everybody's dying for those few guys. You could also argue, well, you know, there are just a few guys who are lucky enough to escape and there wasn't really any altruism there at all. Mm. It's, it's hard to distinguish those two things, right? Yeah, it could be just a random survival, right? Right. Um, and there's no altruism at all. Except when you were an author, it's always nice to have some things that <laughs> really excite people. And since, as they say, altruism is a problem that remains curious and unresolved, yeah, sure. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's nice to think about how this might tie into altruism. Sure. They have this nice model of the, of the two pathways in figure seven, right? So they yes. have this ALD pathway, the new one they discovered in the MOZ EF. And so they, they both, the MAZIF responds to a lot of different stresses, including DNA damage, whereas the ALD only responds to DNA damage. So in a normal uh, population of cells, if you damage the DNA, which one is going to respond? The MAZIF is going to inhibit the ALD. So would the MAZIF respond initially? And if so, under what conditions would the ALD kick in? So I think what would happen here is that the first thing is you would begin the first part of what the ALD pathway is. That is this the SOS response. Mm -hmm. But it's a it's a response that it is a proportional response. So you get it started. Once you get it started, then the MAZIF pathway comes on. The MAZIF pathway inhibits the ALD pathway from continuing too far, and so that the MAZIF pathway then takes precedence. I see. So also in cases where you don't have a lot of population, if you have few cells, so there's no peptide or low, low amounts of peptide, and then if you had DNA damage, you would still want to have some kind of response, and that's where the ALD would kick in, right? Yes, absolutely. All right, okay. So it's really a population control too besides uh, individual cells. That's right. And, you know, in it's always hard to predict. In nature, there may be times when one pathway would really take precedence mm -hmm, over sure. the other. And, and uh, so you don't know that. Yeah, we always do experiments under very controlled conditions, which are abnormal because we're only, we have one species there, right? Yeah. And in nature, there are many interacting. And who knows how that plays into it? Absolutely. So it could be quite different. But we have to be reductionist, otherwise we don't get anything done. <laughs> well, and, and that's this is an example. This is a pretty clever pathway. I mean, to think of a pathway that's dependent upon a ribonuclease that cleaves off the start codon, that's a pretty interesting and specific way of going about turning on different set of gene yeah, expression. It's quite interesting. But evolution can do amazing things. <laughs> yeah. I had a professor once who said, if you can imagine some regulatory pathway somewhere in nature, it happens. <laughs> Absolutely. And on the other hand, things happen that we can't even imagine. I yes. mean, we have, we have gone over some things here on TWIV. I forgot what the last one was. And I said, I couldn't even think this up. Maybe it was the way salmonella um, competes in the gut by having uh, an inflammatory response right. and then using an electron acceptor that uh, the gut bacteria can't use. I could not have thought of that. What? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> I agree. What a very cool and unexpected and clever way of doing business. Yeah, and just imagine how many more are there to be discovered. Right. What worries me, Stanley, is that we don't, 
have enough money anymore to do all this cool stuff. So I look at this paper, and you tell me almost every species has, has similar addiction modules. And you would want to study them all because you'd probably learn different things. But we, we can't. We have to make choices. That's right. Absolutely. And in fact, studying some of these modules in organisms other than E. coli, th there are some interesting side benefits because in E. coli, it's very easy to do genetics and all of this analysis. Some of those organisms are harder to study. So you have to build tools for yeah, the yeah. organism in addition to studying that process. Sure. And we, it's true. The funding for doing research is really very limited now. And it's not clear that's going to get better in the near future. And the other thing is that in addition to less funding, more of the funding is going to really large groups who are focused on some particular single project. So let's say a program project that has 10 people who are all working on a common focus. Mm -hmm. And that, that's cool because it, you, know, it's, you have an army of people focusing on a certain problem. But it misses out on the serendipity. That's right. Right? And there are so many things we'll never discover because we're so focused on so few things. I was thinking that today, driving in, I was thinking how the small groups that do unusual stuff and, and make big discoveries because it's serendipitous, we're going to lose all of that. You know, the like the Phage group in the 40s and 50s who did esoteric stuff and ended up in discovering amazing things, we're getting rid of that kind of science in favor of this big directed kind of stuff, which is fine, as you say, but I, I think we should still have the, the little labs tinkering and finding out things by accident. Right. And, and in fact, those little labs don't demand so much money. Yeah. They just demand somebody shuffling the paper that moves the money back and forth. So phage is coming back for a number of reasons. I mean, the Funding for phage was almost extinct for a while, and, and it's a little better now than it was. Mm -hmm. so not good, but a little better. But some of it, that happened while we still have the people around who are the real phage experts. And some of, you know, there, there are some details about phage that you have to know the biology of the phage or any other virus. It's not just all molecular biology. So I actually, sometime in my life, I went back and I read these old books that were written in the 50s by Adams, and and I went, I read the early papers by Luria and and these guys that where they studied phage, and you learn so many things that no one knows nowadays. Yeah, be yeah. Because th that knowledge is really a very specialized knowledge, but it's the kind of thing that can be so important. For for understanding a genome or something to that effect. Our very own Elio Schechter is somebody who is one of the world's experts in physiology and metabolism. And the wealth of his knowledge and the depth of his knowledge, it, it can't be reproduced in a book. We also don't have people who accumulate that kind of knowledge anymore because everyone tends to be really specialized and they don't have big picture, broad broad views of things, which I don't think is good. And people spend too much time raising money as well, but yeah, that's, that's where we true. are. Well, we, we shouldn't complain too much. We don't <laughs> want to discourage people. Well, so to counter that, if, if, if you want to leave on a more positive yes, note. Yes, let's do that. There are so many really cool questions out there waiting to be answered. And a lot of these things will really impact people's lives. Absolutely. So, yep. It, you know, and we can do things today that we couldn't do five years ago. I'm continually blown away by how an experiment that you may have thought of 10 years ago would have been impossible. You can do it now. Absolutely. Yeah. So. Science is great. Definitely everybody. Don't get discouraged. <laughs> do it. If you right. love it, just do it. Let's take a, let's take a couple of emails here, Stanley. Um, first one is from Charlotte writes, at the beginning of TWIM 28, Michael articulated his love for math, and around minute 12, his desire for ground truthing, the number of times one touches their face. <laughs> <laughs> In response, I offer the attached article from a colleague at UC Berkeley. 
I really admired the candid and humble discussion at the end of the podcast about proper attribution of ideas with warm regards. Minus 65 centigrade in Berkeley. It can't be. It must be 65 Fahrenheit in Berkeley. Oh, yeah. Charlotte. Uh, 65 seems about right for this time of year. Berkeley. Berkeley. Yeah. So she sent us a paper entitled... A study quantifying the hand-to-face contact rate and its potential application to predicting respiratory tract infection. So Michael was wondering about how many times people touch their face per hour, which is quite high. And that, of course, encourages uh, transmission of infections of various sorts. So this paper uh, tries to quantify it. They did a study in which 10 people were videotaped for three hours and they counted how many times they touched their eyes, nose, eyes, nose, and lips. So uh, the co- total contacts per subject, the mean was 47 contact rate per hour, 15.7 touching your, your face in various ways. So 15 times wow. you touch your face. And they, they also um, make predictions about how well this would transmit influenza virus. They, they develop a mathematical model. Uh, and they come up with a uh, a risk assessment of infection, which they come up with 0.01% uh, huh. based on that and making a number of other assumptions. So we'll put that in the show notes for everyone. But that's a number we should remember. 50, we basically touch our face 15 times an hour on average. <laughs> you know, I wonder if people who are trained to work in the lab on pathogens, I wonder if they are better at this <laughs> good if, question yeah. or if it's just such an inherent part of what we do that even when you're working the lab and you think you're not doing that you're still doing it well you know what a good a good way to stop it is to put gloves on I, I notice people when they wear gloves they tend not to touch their face I don't know if you've noticed if, if someone wants to itch themselves they usually do some kind of um, thing with their their arm to scratch their head or something and avoid using the, the glove so that does seem to work well, that's that good all right, thanks for that, Charlotte. The next one is from Carol, who writes, I don't know how I dare email you, as you must be really busy, but here it goes. My name is Carol, and at 51, I have just embarked on a teaching course. My brain cells, I possess a few, are overloaded. My tutor wants me to use innovative new technology in my lesson and write a 4,000-word assignment plus portfolio on the use of such technologies. In the real world, when I teach, often even basic computers or PowerPoints are in short supply. Anything fancier than that is never available. But as this is for an assignment, we must pretend that we have to do it. I teach food safety and thought that a good way of introducing some tech would be to have a microscope in class, but really he's talking of interaction podcasts, phone apps, live chat, and possibly video clips. I don't need anything too techy as this is not biology A-level, just food hygiene. Therefore, something to do with salmonella would be fantastic. Are you aware of any links, materials, videos on this subject or any ideas on how I could use a microscope that would immediately be able to send what it sees to a computer? Think of this as your charity work, helping someone less fortunate than yourself, me. Many thanks and apologies for my forwardness. Hmm. You know, it's hard to tell from this, but one of the... It, but it says, are you aware of links? One really good source for things like this is the the American Society for Microbiology Education Group has a, a site online where they have a lot of different educational materials posted, including uh, micrographs of bacteria and photographs of petri dishes and and techniques, a whole bunch of those things that could be very, very useful in teaching Mm -hmm. food safety. You can certainly find uh, ways to link up microscopes to computers. That's pretty straightforward. Uh, We could put some links for that. I would also suggest you go to Jove, J-O-V-E, I think it's .com, the Journal of Visualized Experiments. This is a place where people uh, do experiments and they videotape them and then they put those online. So you might get some ideas from that. So I would check out those two, Carol, and see what you can come up with. You know, I have a techie thing, too. Yeah. I hope it's not too techie. But there are apps for the iPhone that um, allow you to uh, hook it up to a real simple microscope. That's right, yeah. They're pretty cheap. Uh, I've never personally used them. Mm-hmm. But I think that 
I'm sure you can find out about them by a simple Google search. Yeah. It sounds like she just has to write about these things. Right. You know, this word assignment and the use of such technologies. So, and um, that's a good idea that you could find those very easily by Googling. But we'll, we'll put a link for you just in case, uh, Carol. And if, if our listeners have any ideas for Carol, just send them in at twim at twiv.tv. Uh, the next one is from Alicia, who writes, I am an undergraduate student currently working in Montreal on a co-op where we manipulate yeast to create either the best bread strains, booze <laughs> strains, or biofuel strains. Because of this, I'm always reading up on new articles about biofuel. I was wondering if you had heard about this. She, she links to a, a study, and she says, I wonder what your opinions might be. Thanks for making the hours fly by on the train and in the lab. Always happy to do it. She links to a science article called An Engineered Microbial Platform for Direct Biofuel Production from Brown Macroalgae. So basically, they make uh, ethanol from these macroalgae. Do you know anything about this, Stanley? Oh, you know, I, I haven't read this paper, but I know that they make ethanol nowadays from a million different things. Um, but this... Someone must have thought this was pretty cool for it to be in science. Yeah. They have a, a, a DNA from Vibrio that encodes systems for enzymes for alginate transport and metabolism. Oh, and they use this to... Uh, I think there's more and more of this kind of um, uh, bioprocessing going on, right, Stanley? Yes, and, absolutely. And I think we should get somebody on TWIM who can who can talk about this in some... Do, do you know anyone who is in this area working in it, Stanley, that we might oh. be able to talk with? I'll, I'll think about that and yeah. get back to you. But you know, one of the other things that's important, and I think it's completely neglected when people talk about these biofuels, sometimes with some of these algae, in addition to generating the fuel you want, you mm -hmm. make some toxic byproducts. Sure. And so thinking about how you're going to get rid of those byproducts, is a, it adds a, a level of complexity and, and interest to these projects too. There are always considerations on in a paper like this, it may look great, but as you said, there could be byproducts, there could be yield issues, it may cost too much, it may not be uh, energy efficient. So for these to be translated into actually producing fuel may be harder than, than it would first appear. But there are experts who know more than I do, certainly, about that. And you got to start somewhere. Yeah, but we will, Alicia will try and get someone on. The last one is from Peter. Dear TWIM team, I came across this new scientist article on the general disregard for microbial life in conservation and the need for education to counteract negative perceptions of microbial life. So this is, he wants our comments. This is an article in the New Scientist, Let's Protect Earth's Unseen Life. It's basically about the idea that we're trying to conserve uh, lots of things on Earth, but we're disregarding the microbes. And it says here in the beginning, if the last blue whale choked to death on the last panda, it would be disastrous, but not the end of the world. But if we accidentally poisoned the last two species of ammonia oxidizers, that would be another matter. It could be happening now. We wouldn't even know. <laughs> I had not, actually not thought of this, Stanley. Have, have you the idea that we should worry about microbial communities? I love this, <laughs> actually. <laughs> you know, right now, I don't know if you know this, but this is the 50th anniversary of the book Silent Spring mm -hmm. that was the birth of the environmental sciences movement in the United States. And it's very interesting because the book was written in 1962. And one of the things she really focuses on is our release of some toxic chemicals and copper compounds and things like that into the environment. And of course, she talks about the impact on plants and animals, but she also talks about the impact on the microbial populations in the soil and the water and what that will do in the long term for um, the growth and sustainability of that particular environment. Mm -hmm. So this idea is not a new idea. 1962, quite a while ago. Yeah. Right? I suspect that our microbial communities are pretty resilient and they adapt to conditions very well. And so probably they'll be here long after we're gone. <laughs> <laughs> I think you're absolutely right. But um, in, in the low, so I, I was talking local, not, yeah. not global environment. But in a local environment, I think we really can change them in a way sure. that can have important impacts. 
And there's a second thing too, and that is that they may not adapt, they may evolve, right? Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Yes. But, so they could change it to something that's not very friendly for us to have mm-hmm. around. That's true. Um, I think part of the goal of ASM is to try and raise awareness of these kinds of issues. And one of the things they say at the end of this is to change public perceptions that bacteria are bad and fungi are poisonous. And I think ASM does try a lot to try and uh, counter some of that, don't you think? Absolutely. (laughs) All the time. (laughs) So, uh, Peter, I think uh, this is quite an important issue. Um, But, you know, what drives what happens on Earth is largely profit and expansion. And we don't have typically regard for anything but ourselves. And it's really unfortunate. There's a there's a lo- small fraction of us who really care, but um, it's very tough to make progress in this area. And that'll do it for email. Is that is that it for you as well, Stanley? That's it for me. I'm I have to run off to class now. Are you teaching a class? I am giving a guest lecture in a class. Oh, so all right, have a good time. I want to thank you for joining us. I appreciate your coming in at the last minute. It was wonderful talking to you, Vincent. Thanks very much. Okay. Have a good class. Take care. Bye. Bye. Stanley, of course, is from San Diego State University. Thanks a lot, Stanley. And that just leaves me here alone to wrap it up. It's it's really weird because I'm never alone on any of my podcasts. And that's done on purpose because they're supposed to be conversations. So I'll wrap this up really quickly. You can find TWIM at iTunes, at the Zoom Marketplace, and at microbeworld.org. We also have an app for your iPhone or iPad or Android device. You can find that over at Microbe World as well. You can stream the devices uh, and listen to them that way. You can go over to microbeworld.org slash TWIM where we keep all of our show notes as well as the episodes archived as well. If you like TWIM, tell others about it. And if you're new to iTunes, you've just subscribed, please leave a, a comment over on the podcast page there. It helps us to stay more visible in the Apple directory and helps more people discover us, which is what we want. As always, send us your questions and comments. We love to get them. Send them to twim at twiv.tv. I'm Vincent Racaniello, and you can find me at virology.tv. WS. I'd like to thank the American Society for Microbiology for their support of TWIM, Communications Director Barbara Hyde, and Chris Condian and Ray Ortega for all their behind-the-scenes help. Thanks for listening, everyone. We'll see you next time on This Week in Microbiology.